Welcome to the Wellcast. The world has a lot to say. We're bringing a biblical perspective to those conversations. Welcome back to the Wellcast, everybody. Um, it is your host, Melissa Denisi. Our co-host, Jordan Hogue, is still out enjoying his last few weeks of sabbatical. And so we hope you're resting well, Jordan. We can't wait for you to come back and join us and share all of your stories of what you've learned um, as you've been off resting. So, but today I have two special guests with me. David and Molly DeFrank are here. And we're going to talk about what it means to serve faithfully. So we get to talk about the foundational practice from um, our theme verse for this practice is Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. And you are two people I think of who shine your light really well for others um, to see our Father in heaven. So why don't you guys introduce yourselves? David, I'll let you go first. Just kind of introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your daily life, how long you've been at the well, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for having us. My name's uh, David DeFrank, and uh, Molly and I are parents to six little kiddos. That's a big part of our daily life, as you might yeah. imagine. <laughs> um, we uh, have been tending the well, gosh, some 13 years now. We've been life group leaders for about 10 um, so that's kind of one of our primary serve opportunities. Yeah. Uh, I'd say first and foremost, being a husband is, uh, you know, kind of the central hub in which I, I take on that servant role or I try to. Uh, and then as a dad, uh, as life group leader, I'm also the president of the board over at Clovis Unified. Well, uh, that's a big one. That's, that takes up a good chunk <laughs> of time. And then I've also have the honor of being an advisor to uh, City Church, which the well has yeah. been partnering with and uh, some incredible things going on over there. So a lot of opportunities that God has put before me and just grateful for all of them. And you have a job too, right? I do have a pesky day job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I work for the government as a as a, an attorney. So I that's also a great serve opportunity as yep. well. Yep. How about you, Molly? Um, as David mentioned, we've got six kids at home. They're not so little anymore from ages six to f- almost 14. By the time this comes out, oh I'm like, 2014 is crazy. Um, so yeah, the mornings are always a little bonkers getting them off to school um and I also write I'm a writer I'm working on book number two right now which is very fun um and yeah David and I co-lead a life group of married couples with lots of kids I think I we tallied the number of kids in our life group a long time ago I don't remember how many. close to a million it's probably I know. a whole school so <laughs> 30,000 I think is what it was um and yeah I I coach at women's bible study Woohoo! and that's so fun and we also uh, volunteer at City Church monthly. We help out with the child care in there. And then we have some some serving that we do kind of like intermittently. Um, I do some things for a pregnancy care center for their um, their fundraiser or something. We like to partner with them. They do really great work in our city. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, I don't think I knew that about you. I knew you had done done some stuff in life groups in the past with them, but... Do we help them make tea sandwiches every year for their big fundraiser, which is Look coming at up. That's that. why it's probably at the top of my mind, but it's real fun. When's the fundraiser? It's in the next couple of weeks. I don't remember the day. I need to look at my calendar. Okay, but it's coming it's up. It's coming up. Because you have six kids, you know it's on your calendar, and somewhere. that's all that matters. Exactly. So Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a whopper of a question here. How does the gospel motivate your serving? Yeah, for me, I think one of the biggest things the gospel does is it um, it really changes your timeline horizon for how you kind of conceptualize your existence, right? Before the gospel, it's 80 years, and you're, you're kind of constrained by uh, the fallenness of creation. And so quite rationally, you think, well, I'm going to live for, for myself. I'm going to spend my time on mm-hmm. myself. I'm going to, how do I decrease discomfort and how do I increase fun? Yep. Um, and that's all I really care about. So why would I? Why would I serve people? And um, what the gospel does is it, it, you know, Romans 2 says, okay, now I'm immortal. Okay, so I've got a lot more to think about than those 80 years. I've got an, an eternity to think about after that. And that eternity is not just uh, longer, a lot longer than my life on this earth. It's a lot different. It's There's no more death or crying or pain, and God's going to be my God, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So now... What used to be the most important thing was the 80 years. Be, it drastically decreases in importance. And now 
what it's only important insofar as it impacts eternity. Yeah. And and so now there's a there's a huge uh, trade off. Of course, I'm going to trade a little bit of uh, less free time, a little bit of discomfort in this life for the rewards God says I get if I'm serving faithfully in this life. So it really reorients what's your priorities and what's important. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I tend towards moralism. So I think before I became a believer, really, I was going to church every Sunday, grew up Catholic. And I thought that if I did the right things, that that was good. You know, I was impressing God kind of thing. Yeah. And so the gospel broke into that for me because I'm freed from needing to strive to prove myself because Jesus did that for me. Um, but I'm freed into using what I have to be part of the kingdom work that God has planned out for me. Yeah. Um, so then I get to serve joyfully and without the burden of, of needing to accomplish some unknown amount of tasks or whatever. Yeah. So moving from that serving for his approval or for, um, yeah, the pat on the back, mm-hmm. but but instead moving into serving from his love, from his grace. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the gospel motivates you guys to serve, and you each serve. Some of the places you serve are similar, but some of them are different. So I would love to hear kind of your journey to how you said yes to the places that you're serving, and, and maybe give us a little bit more, because David, you rattled off quite a few things, but... Um, maybe break down a little bit more of what you do. What do you do for um, City Church? And what does it look like serving in such a, an incredible role in our city on the school board? So maybe how that, how that came to be and what that looks like for you. Yeah. Um, so both of those opportunities really felt like, um, I think sometimes God makes it more obvious that, uh, you know, kind of how exactly he orchestrated um, your path towards something. And both of those, it felt, it felt that way that he decided to, in his grace, show me what he was doing, uh, in the moment. But, uh, for, for city church, I'll start with, um, Molly's brother, Mark, who we're obviously very close with is, has been the, uh, kind of the founding pastor over there and is an incredible advocate for the potential of, uh, the amount of change that can be done in that area. It's in downtown Fresno. And, you know, you look at, the per capita churches, you know, on knees, and then you compare it to, you know, downtown Fresno, the, you know, the triangle between all the freeways and it's night and day. I mean, mm-hmm. you got, you know, 10 churches on knees and just a handful in, in a much bigger area down, down there in downtown. And so, uh, I saw the vision that, that Mark had, that the well had with partnering with that, with that church. And so, uh, Mark approached me and, uh, you know, kind of the rest is history. And that's yeah. been, that's been a true uh, pleasure to see what, uh, that's an opportunity for us to serve as a family together. We'll go down there and uh, Molly will work with the kiddos and maybe I'll work with the older ones and um, just seeing some incredible things happening over there. For the the school board, uh, you know, I had um, been interested in elected office for some time in my life. I think that was an interest that, um, God has, you know, given me and made me uh, oriented towards. And uh, I ran for an office in 2012 and lost. And um, Was that president of the United States? Yeah, just barely. I just barely lost. Mitt Mitt (laughs) pulled it out. No, but um, (laughs) so that was for assembly. And, you know, that didn't pan out. I think uh, there were a lot of great great things that came out of that run. And so I'm I'm grateful for having had that experience. But... um, Later on, you know, Molly and I had been, I say Molly and I, Molly had been homeschooling the, the children. Um, uh, I remember that. Yeah. And a, and a big motivation for that was that, you know, it felt like how, how can we be teaching our kids science without it being expressly about God? How can we be teaching them about history without it being expressly about God? And so Molly, you know, kind of took that upon her shoulders to just kind of weave God into all, everything that they're learning, which was, which was so huge. Well, eventually we made the decision for a, uh, host of reasons that we were going to move our kids, transition them back into public school. Um, but uh, one of the things that our good friend Jeff Crone would always say is they would say, people would ask him when he was getting uh, homeschooling their kids, how do you have enough time to do that? And mm-hmm. he would always turn it back and then he said, how do you have enough time to make sure that the things your kids are learning in public school are 
in line with what mm. you'd like? And how are you making sure you're speaking in it? He's like, that takes a lot more time. Yeah. And uh, so we said, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to need to be mindful about what's going on and maybe not even just informed, but maybe impacting how things are going to go oh, that's for powerful. our kids. And so uh, I just, the representative from my area was not running for reelection and uh, I was able to get her support and was able to win uh, in 2020. Gosh, it feels like a long, <laughs> it feels like much longer ago than that. So I've been on that for, uh, on that board well, for about Well, 2020 to 2023 is really like 50 years. It's, a time it's not warp. really three years. So it, yeah. It was a, it's been a time <laughs> warp, but, but also just looking back, I see, okay, I'm, I'm so glad I did, uh, I did that. I'm so glad that that was one of the works that God had prepared for me beforehand because, um, even with its ups and downs, it's just been rewarding. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the things, um, and maybe this is getting into the weeds, but what mm-hmm. are some of the things you're seeing right now um, that you get to speak into? I love how you said that I not only, I get to impact possibly where where things are going. So what are some of those things that you're speaking into and using using your gift of service to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what's wonderful is that obviously as a, as a school district, as a government agency, you know, Clopas Unified's not, you know, expressly Christian or anything by any means, but uh, the founding superintendent over there, Doc Buchanan, his, a lot of the philosophies he instilled over there are, you know, a lot of the, all the great ideas ultimately trace back to the Bible, right. right? And he was, he emphasized relationships and that was always what he felt made uh, a school district function well mm-hmm. and and serve its students best and so uh he created a wonderful foundation and was the superintendent for 30 plus years and so what's a real benefit is is i feel like our role is now to protect that precious uh thing that he created mm-hmm. and shepherd it through a, a hot what's becoming an increasingly hostile environment yeah. and so instead of having to fight to change everything instead it's more of a fight to preserve mm-hmm. and um so I think a big part of that is articulating and and expressing why his vision is so valuable and why it's so good for kids and families. And I do think when we were going through, for example, the foundation study, I really appreciated going through uh, the abilities section of the Uniquely You. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the ones I felt comfortable uh, identifying for myself and was affirmed by my wife is just the idea of, you know, analyzing or providing arguments. And so I felt like my, um, maybe my natural abilities lined up well for what was needed in this position, which is to kind of, um, like I said, steward this and defend Mm -hmm. it from people who would, who would go a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that natural ability plays well into your work too, I imagine. Right. Yeah. And it's one of those deals where, you know, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about you know, the verse, uh, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart and thinking about what it doesn't mean. But, you know, one of the things it does mean is that if you're trying to pursue God, and, you know, in the spirit, then the, a lot of times, hopefully over time, the things that you want are the things that God wants yeah. for you. You know, he's, he's shaping your heart in that way. And so I do think he's given me a natural desire to do these things and then has clearly set up opportunities for me to be able to do them. And so I'm just so grateful to him for, for that. Um, I think, you know, the idea of a hand not trying to be a foot and a foot not trying to be an eye, you know, in terms of the members of the body, it it embodies this idea that not that we'll never not have to do something we don't want to, Mm -hmm. but that God's design would be that we generally are doing things in which we find life and enjoyment. Um, so yeah, and your calling, your gifts, your abilities are going to play out differently and put you in different places than your brother-in-law who is mm-hmm. now pastoring the church, right? And you're needed where where you're serving and he's needed where he's serving. Something you just said I had never really connected, but you are two of the most relational people that I've ever met, but that you talked about serving on the board um, and bringing up relationship. And I feel like that's what City Church is about. And so Molly, will you share a little bit about what you guys are doing as a family, what you're doing there at City Church and how you're serving. Yeah, so we go to City Church um, once a month and we bring the kids and we help support them in childcare. So um, my kids will go into the childcare rooms and my older kids will come and be helpers in those rooms and we just love on these kids and take care of them so that their parents can go to church. Um, We've also done different, like, 
outreach activities with them where it's, you know, it's in a rough part of town. Um, but the park nearby that one weekend morning, it was, it was actually really beautiful. It's this park where some kind of shady things happen most of the time, Mm -hmm. but on this Saturday morning, no, it was free food and music and, um, you know, games for the kids to play with. We had a lot of friends from our life group come out and, um, Mike Sladen was there with off the front. They were fixing bikes for these neighborhood kids. And, um, it was just really fun. My, my oldest daughter, I was sharing earlier, um, we were at this booth giving out free food and she just lit up every time we gave free food to someone. She's like, this is the best. I love this. This is so fun. And, um, and it was really wild because you're seeing, you know, you're seeing people that, that my kids don't see. Like they don't see every day someone right. dressed head to toe in a gang color. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They don't see every day people just trying to get by like that. And so to to show them like these people live not that far away from us and they need help and they need Jesus. And right now they need some food. And so mm-hmm. why don't we help them with that? Yeah. So that we have the rapport. And it's just really cool to kind of step in. And, you know, we only go down there. We were there once a month. Um, but they're doing work, you know, Mark's there full time right. trying to serve this community. And so that's one thing that encouraged me and continues to encourage me that, um, you know, if you're listening and you can't do everything and you can't do this Mm -hmm. full-time serve thing, but you can show up once a month and and hold a baby or play with a toddler like that, that makes a difference. Yeah. So maybe on that note, because a lot of people have hindrances, right, to serving, what would you say are some of those hindrances or hesitations that come, um, not just sit serving in city church, but just serving anywhere. What are some things that you've seen? Cause I know you're passionate about this and I know you serve not because you have all kinds of white space on your calendar or right. You have six kids, you write, you're serving. So what are some of the things that you see, um, are reasons why we wouldn't serve? Yeah, I think there are three that come to mind. The first one is just we're, we're overscheduled. I think we are mm-hmm. chronically overscheduled yep. with, with um, sports and whatever extracurriculars are going on. And, you know, I think we need to approach it like, well, what are, like David was talking about, it's not about the, the 80 years, it's about forever. So right. when what are we showing our kids that is important to us? Does our calendar reflect that? So um, I think if we can commit to even showing up at church weekly, then we can, of course, have serving worked into our into our daily rhythms or mm-hmm. weekly rhythms or monthly rhythms. Um, and then the second the second thought I had about that was um, or excuse maybe was you know maybe I just um, I'm scared. Mm-hmm. I don't want to bring my kids into a shady part of town. What if mm-hmm. they get hurt? Shouldn't I protect them from that? And I actually think the more realistic fear for me and the one I'm way more afraid of is that my kids would grow up, going to church, they would see that we have this life group, but they don't ever, they're never exposed to people who, who are the most vulnerable, who actually mm-hmm. need tangible help and that they would move out and walk away from the faith. Cause they'd go, gosh, we said all these things, but we never did anything about it. Right. And I can see the need and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't go together. So I think that's the real fear is kids walking away from the faith as they grow up because it wasn't real. Mm-hmm. It didn't have legs. Um, and then the last thing is just, frankly, sometimes we don't want to. <laughs> sometimes we really covet that little mar- space, I'm that tired. margin. Exactly. I, yeah, yeah. And 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 honestly, I think everyone who who serves regularly hits a wall sometimes where they gotta get their shoes on and now get up and walk out mm-hmm. the door and go commit the next couple hours. And sometimes you you wrestle the flesh like I don't want to, and I commit and I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. And you wrestle through it, and then afterwards you're always. Like, gosh, Lord, thanks for letting me be a part of that. Yeah, that was worthwhile. Yeah. David, would you add anything to that if there are maybe hindrances or hesitations people have with serving or you have? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Molly was kind of hitting on it on the end there, too, is that a lot of times people are like, well, I don't have joy or I don't have peace about X, Y or Z. But a lot of times that happens after not or during, but not before. Right. Right. So you're not going to have the joy of serving as you're needing to turn off the TV and get in the car in the cold and go do something it's going to be you know when you're there and so you can't rely on the your feelings in the moment of you know I feel like doing it or I feel this or that way you just got to say hey God's called me to do this and what's great is he usually is faithful to hopefully give you that experience that uh, of joy Uh, not every time but um, that can't be your motivator but I think that your answer really kind of 
is in line with the, you know, the seed that's sown in the ground with the thorns, you know, it, it would, would have been fruitful otherwise, but you know, the, the worries of this life, the pursuit of wealth and the desire for other things choke it out. And I think what's so pernicious about that is that you don't, it doesn't feel wrong in the moment. It doesn't feel wrong to be on PTC and have your kids in a thousand sports and, and, uh, you know, be working overtime all the time. And that's because those things in and of themselves aren't wrong. But if they're choking out your ability to be fruitful for the kingdom, then there's a there's a problem. Yeah. And, and there, something needs to to give way. And so uh, and that may include radical changes to your life. It may be I need to change jobs and that may mean I need to be in a smaller house because I don't have any time to serve. But if you're prioritizing, th- if your mind is set on God's kingdom and not this world, then it, that may be what it's called for. And you may be in a situation where no, I just need to make a couple smaller changes in my life to make sure I have that margin. But, but you can't let these um, kind of the idea of the classic American middle class life be your goal and crowd out what God's called us to yeah. do. And yeah. and and I'm saying that from experience because I've definitely been in those seasons where I'm like, no, I want the, yeah, I just want the picket fence and whatever I need to do that and, and the dog and the and the happy smiling kids, um, but that's not the goal. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate you even that third point of just, I don't want to, because Mm -hmm. it hits on the idol of our heart, whether that's comfort or selfishness, whatever it is. And when you said that, I was thinking about how I have, I have prayed to get to know my neighbors better. And I have one little slice of margin on a Friday afternoon that I just love to be home with my kids, you know, relaxing and a neighbor invites us over for a play date. And I'm like, I don't want to go. Even though I prayed, I want to get to know my neighbor. And in that moment, so Molly's on my little inner circle text. And I said, hey, um, my neighbor invited us over. And I don't want to go, but we're going to go. And it ends up the kids are having fun. I'm building a relationship. But just to even admit that sometimes that's really why we don't. is just we don't want to. Um, Yeah. So um, one of the things that I know you did this a few years ago. But I think when I think about the that. Uh, scripture to go and make disciples and what that go means is kind of like as you are going so what you're already doing in your life um, how can you make disciples in that and and I was reminded of something that you did a few years ago when you had a preschool co-op um, when you had preschoolers wow so yeah this was a few many few years yeah. ago but will you share a little bit um i didn't tell you i was going to ask you about this but it was just really a sweet and simple way that as you were going as you were raising your preschoolers you had a pretty cool serve um experience opportunity that you were doing it, during those years so we share a little bit about what you're doing there yeah um it's it's probably that tension it was born out of that tension that i think believing moms have when their kids are little where you're like I want to serve I hear messages like this I do my study and I want to go out and serve but I've got these little kids at home and um you know I I kind of realized that gosh if I can't I didn't feel like I could serve but you know, I was always making it to my play dates or doing the preschool co-ops and so I'm like well, what if we just exported that and offered this preschool like homeschool co-op for young kids and their moms at, down at Martin Park um so I got some moms together and they were amazing. It, it was crazy. The, the moms who are their friends, but it's like former teachers and oh, early yeah. education specialists and all these people in our church. There's so many of incredibly gifted women. Um, and we would meet up and plan out what we were going to cover. And then we would go once a week or I, I think it was like on Fridays. And um, yeah, we would just meet with the moms and kids and use our broken Spanish that we took and mm-hmm, mm-hmm, way back in college. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we kind of just invest in those relationships and they would keep coming back and it was really sweet um, and a really great opportunity. And I I think I realized, um, you know, there are things that we're already doing in suburbia. Yeah. There are, there are things that um, if we just tweak them a little bit um, and get our friends together and kind of dream and brainstorm, we can turn it into a serving opportunity. Yeah. Um, So that was actually a lot of fun. And then we, but I think the last week we actually took in our first foster child and so I'm like okay I can't do that anymore (laughs) but it was a really great opportunity and we were actually talking about hopefully getting people together to maybe do that at at city center when it opens so anyway if you're if you're listening and interested in that yeah you can email Molly and she'll tell you where to go and what to do yeah yeah uh yeah can we talk about what you just said because you guys are also foster and adoptive 
parent. So will you share a little bit about how God led you to that journey and what that's looked like for you? How did that stir in your hearts to serve? Yeah, I think that God was working on each of us, you know, before we even met each other uh, on that front. You know, I I remember as a teenager coming across one of those, I don't know if they still have them, but those websites of like children who are looking for adoptive parents. I can't remember if this was international or not. This was a long time ago. But, it, you know, they have a little blurb like, you know, little Sammy likes to do X, Y, and Z, and mm-hmm. they got a cute picture of him. And I remember thinking human beings shouldn't have to market themselves mm-hmm. for lo- the love mm-hmm. of a parent. Like there's something very, very wrong about that. And I remember just feeling so, you know, disquieted about that. As a that. teenager, yeah, you uh, knew, yeah. okay, this is not. And just like, mm-hmm. whoa, that I, I just didn't really appreciate that fact that pe- some people have to try and acquire the love of a mom and dad Mm -hmm. they don't they're not just born with it right which is which is god's design is that we're all born you know and so we're all born with that need we're born with the need of a love of a parent uh, or two and some kids just don't get that and it's not you know it's just not fair that you have to market yourself so i said well i can either just get sad about it or we can kind of do something about it and luckily the woman of my dreams also feels the same way and so we we got to have the blessing. Well, you know, all in God's timing, we were in Sacramento. Our initial plan was to adopt, you know, from the beginning mm-hmm. as our as our first. And we, I think we did one or two classes and then Molly got pregnant and then boom, 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 I'm boom. Pregnant, I'm pregnant, and I'm four pregnant, I'm pregnant. Four kids in how many years? Five and a half. Five and a half. <laughs> so then after that, we said, okay, now we can get back to, to what we want to do. And now we have, we have two wonderful kids that we've uh, been able to adopt and it's been a journey uh, of growth and love and difficulty, and it's just been it's been wonderful and hard. Yeah. Yep. So serving isn't always easy. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there's joy mm. when you obey God. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? Just about your journey with how that all came to be. I think that was the clearest example for me of serving, moving from like a separate part of my life to fully integrating serving and living out the gospel. And this is just, this is just the rhythm of life now. Yeah, You know, it's like when you're kind of getting started, you're like, Oh, let's get a serve project in here and there. And then when it's full time around the clock and then it, there are parts of you that you see, you're like, Oh, I didn't know I had that junk in there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had that impatience or whatever you find. And you'll find a lot if you (laughs) go down this road, I promise. Um, but it's, God is really efficient in how he has refined me through serving and through just pursuing him first. I mean, you know, it's really messy and I've fallen my face a lot, Mm -hmm. but he really does use serving him to do it. Yeah. I think what I saw in you too was just the Lord break your heart and you pursue him in it. That like David said, this isn't right. And if I can do something to step in and redeem a broken situation, then I want to do that. And no, it was not easy, but it's been beautiful to watch and to see you enter in that way too. So um, what are some of maybe the, the current needs you see either in the church or in culture And maybe some ways that we can serve. I know we've kind of covered a little bit, but are there things that you guys would want to specifically, you know, and I think of of the places that you sit in government, life group leader, uh, city church, you know, the the council um, or uh, the school board. So what are some needs that you're seeing? So I think the greatest need that our area and probably our country needs, and I see it across all the positions you just mentioned, is that I think there's an utter collapse in parenting. Um, uh, some of it is situational and environmental, but a lot of it is parents are just completely checking out and abdicating their responsibility mm-hmm. to train their children in the way they should go. And you have parents who either themselves are spending their all their whole time on screens or the kids are doing that. And, uh, and through that social media, kids are raising other kids rather than parents raising oh, kids. That's a terrifying thought. And, and, and it is reverberating throughout our society. So in so many different ways. So, at City Church, you know, you see kind of sometimes the consequences of fatherlessness specifically mm-hmm. and how that um, creates a cycle of young boys who grow up to 
mistreat women or abuse substances. And of course, that's not the only story down there, but mm-hmm. that's, that is one that you see. And then, you know, in Clovis Unified, you can see a lot of these kids, they're, they're struggling and it's not because of the teachers. It's not because of anything the school's doing. It's because their home life is an absolute disaster mm-hmm. and there's no structure. And these kids, you, it doesn't matter how good the teaching is. You know, you if you have no one at home or the people at home are fighting or they're hurting you, it's tough. It's tough to succeed right. in those situations in any sense of the word succeed. So I think there's an utter collapse in parenting. And while obviously the ideal would be that those parents all shape up, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so how I think for everybody, I, I'm obviously, from my perspective, I really see the need for men, but, a, you know, adult, steady adults for children. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, while the ideal is that would be one of your parents, hey, if, if what it is is instead you're a coach and you're, you're pulling that boy aside or that girl aside and you're, you're entering in on another level with them and you're trying to teach them about, how to go about life in a in a productive and and non-destructive you know non-harmful way that's huge so find for me i think the greatest of our serve opportunity would be find ways to influence children who are lost and to be the one steady adult that will help them you know see god in his aspect of the father uh in a positive light because so many of these kids grow up and they say well god is a father gosh my father wasn't around or he was awful um, but, but man, coach so-and-so was really something else. And he showed me that, okay, there are people who are, who are doing good by God's grace and I can have this hope in, in humanity again. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. And so interesting as you're talking, because my son's in a K-8 school for Fresno Unified and they just put out, I don't know, eight different sports looking for coaches. Mm. And it, it, not until you're talking, did it dawn on me that is an incredible serve opportunity you want to relive your glory days as a football player you could coach some eighth grade boys in football and influence them for the kingdom of god wow yeah um i got caught up in that i don't even remember the question now molly but what was it oh what do you see what are some needs that you see Uh i mean i would echo that train up disciple your kids and invest in those relationships Mm -hmm. um I, I look at a, our church and how big it is and um, how many talented, incredible people mm-hmm. are here. And I just think, it, it and throughout our city and all the other churches, and I think about the need in our city and how if we could align those things, if we could kind of light a fire and um, if people would step out and, mm-hmm. and serve consistently um, and bring along their kids and disciple them along the way, I think it would be incredible. I think it would just change the trajectory of, you know, everything going wrong from substance abuse to people who just are so walking so far away from God mm-hmm. and so far away from the faith. So, yeah, I think just continue to to train up your kids and um, enter by the narrow gate, you know, yeah. just because everyone's yeah. doing it one way doesn't mean – we, and it's, in fact, we should be doing it the opposite way. We right. should look out there and see distinct. how it's going, mm-hmm. and we should be distinct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, any encouragement, last, maybe a final, I don't know, encouragement to those listening that you want to share about serving? You know, I, I would just point out that one um, insight God showed me through Scripture is um, he would have every right to say, hey, you need to serve because it's its own reward or because um, it's just the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but gosh, you look through scripture and no, instead what he says is, you know, serve faithfully uh, for the Lord will reward everyone, whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. Or, you know, even you think about praying, you know, don't don't pray to get your reward from men, but instead go in secret, not because prayer is its own reward, although it is, but also because God will see what you do in secret and will reward you. Mm. Um, so this idea is, I think, Obviously, the, the primary purpose, as we discussed about in Matthew 5, is to reflect God's nature to other people. Um, but what's wonderful is that God doesn't say uh, th- that needs to be your only motivation. He expressly appeals to our desire for reward in the next life. So if if sometimes that's what you need to get going is, man, you know, I'd, I'd really like another, another reward in heaven. I'm, I don't really feel like going out and doing this thing, but I'm going to do it because 
it's going to be worth it. It's going to mm-hmm. pay off. Mm-hmm. And if that's what you need, the Bible expressly encourages that. So mm-hmm. don't feel guilty about that. In my opinion, I think the Bible expressly appeals to that, and that can absolutely be a motivator. Sometimes it's my motivation. Yeah. Absolutely. We can all live in your mansion when we get down. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm doing a good job with it, but it's my motivation. So. I would just you? say start somewhere. Just start somewhere. You know, they're... Right now, is this going to come out before Serve Fresno? No, it's not. Okay. Well, but that's okay because you're allowed to serve. You're allowed to serve. Any day <laughs> exactly. of the year, you not have to just Serve it. Fresno. I was going to say it's a click away to find like a million options. But, but yes. Even so, I mean, there are so many ways to get involved using your own gifts. So just do a little, do like one little thing and, and see how it goes. And yeah. if it, if it stinks or you hate it or you're not, it's like really not consistent with your wiring, like. Try something else next time, you know? So I was, David and I were talking about the podcast a a little bit ago, and I was saying, man, one one serve fail I remember having was I signed up for this, like, paint and outdoor restoration project, and I felt like it was horrible. (laughs) I am not wired for outdoor (laughs) activities. Like, I think I created more work for the people who needed to fix my painting job. It was so bad, but... No one's asking me to help them like organize a closet oh, or yeah. paint. And mm-hmm. so, you know, if you try something and it's and you hate it or it just goes poorly, like try something else. So yeah. just get started. Yeah. I think you guys inspire a lot of us, but live that out of like a, a go once a month and hold a baby at City Church. Or if the Lord's calling you to go and serve in these positions in our city of influence go and do that thing I know after talking to you guys I feel like um kind of the picture in my in my mind right now is okay my my hands and feet are here on earth for people but my eyes are towards heaven and so how am I just continuing to point people to him I want you to come and see come and see come and see so um thanks you guys for being here and for sharing these different ways that you're serving and encouraging us to do that so thanks for coming we hope to have you back one day too so thanks for having us Thank you for listening to this episode of The Wellcast. As always, don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about us. For more information about The Well Community Church, visit thewellcommunity.org.